If everything is relative, what can be more relative than relations between the sexes? Every week, your host, Jack Kammer, talks with a man or a woman on the podcasts Men Are Talking or Goodwill Toward Men and aims to deliver at least one idea that will make you think, wow, I never thought of it like that. Today, Jack talks with a man on Men Are Talking. Today on Men Are Talking, we talk with William Allen, a man who has come to realize that he's like a lot of men who, in a particular way, challenge the ideal of what men are supposed to be. Bill is what is increasingly coming to be termed a highly sensitive person, and in particular, a highly sensitive man. He's on a mission to help us all recognize the special contributions highly sensitive men can make to healthy societies, and why being a highly sensitive man, though often understood and even ridiculed, is something to be valued and appreciated. Hello, Bill Allen. Well, hi, Jack. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. In 2020, about a year ago, you published a book called Confessions of a Sensitive Man, an unconventional defense of sensitive men. And so I want to ask you by way of asking you to talk about the book. Okay. Um, why, did, why did it, why was it named Confessions of a Sensitive Man rather than The Proclamation of a Sensitive Man? A and why was it a defense of sensitive men rather than a celebration of sensitive men? Well, I think for me personally, and I think it's true for a lot of sensitive men, people who have this characteristic, and it's a personality characteristic, so it's called sensory processing sensitivity, right? So it is something that's been defined by science, and particularly we can attribute a lot of that to Dr. Elaine Aaron, who really has written a book about high sensitivity. But for a lot of men, this term sensitive is very difficult to swallow. And I figured that what I would try to do in my book is, is, and I did reveal a lot of personal information about me and the struggles I had with this personality characteristic, especially when you stack it up against what we expect men to be. Uh, and it's a lot of times the antithesis of what we describe as a sensitive man. That I thought it, it would be my confessions, although you're right, it is in many ways a proclamation of who I was. And what I was trying to do is not so much take a conventional defense of sensitivity in men. It was to sort of, uh, instead of taking kind of a high road and say, well, you know, it's something that certain men have and we should all get together and, and, and embrace that. It was the idea that is that we're going to take a hard stand on this, that this is really not a bad thing and that men should start looking at it as a gift, a trait that is actually, I think, necessary for the human species to have in it. And this is also a position that Dr. Aaron has, that she consider, considers it to be an evolutionary trait. So instead of just writing something about, well, here I am, this is what I did, I wanted to take that approach. Of, I'll give you some of what happened to me. I'll confess some things that I did, some mistakes I made. Because it's not always been a trait that's been known and published and talked about. It's just something that was, it's always been with the human species. It's just never been something that men typically embrace. And the other part of that was defending that so that these men could at least have some uh, ground, solid ground to say, you know, maybe it's not such a bad thing and, and, and I can start looking and embracing it. You know, and that's, that's kind of the gist of what was going on in the title. There is a community of sorts around the idea of human sensitivity. Um, HSM, no, HSP, highly sensitive people. Correct. Uh, we're talking today about HSM, highly sensitive men. Could you talk a little bit about that community and the support that uh, uh, is traded back and forth in that community? Yeah, this is something that's it's it's a growing. I, I hate to call it a movement yet, but I think it's 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 heading in that direction. 
Um, because men are, as I said earlier, they're really having a struggle with trying to embrace this quality. And, and certainly one of the best ways to do that is to, to be able to um, talk to other men who have this uh, uh, characteristic. And in doing so, it is in a lot of ways self-validating. You, you start seeing that, and this has been my experience, as I've talked to men uh, from all over the world, different cultures, different backgrounds, yet nevertheless, we all share the same quality and there is a relatability to that quality. And I see this community starting to grow. There's, there's a lot of uh, uh, people that are now taking up the task of writing books um, and sharing their experiences much like I did. Um, one of the leading people uh, I'd say that is uh, really spearheading this is Dr. Tracy Cooper, who's written several books on high sensitivity. In fact, he's written a book that even drills a little deeper about high sensation seeking highly sensitive people. So that's really kind of a getting down the weeds on that. But there is a, a, a percentage of the population of highly sensitive men that do have that, that characteristic as well. So the more we talk about it, the more that's out there, we're starting to bond together and we're seeing it kind of like being a tribe. We're a tribe of people. We share this characteristic, regardless of our cultural background, regardless of our our race, regardless of our religious beliefs or philosophies, we all have this same characteristic that bonds us together. And I do see that it's growing. According to your book, about um, 20% of the population is highly sensitive. Is that, that correct? The, yeah, that's the, the typical number that's thrown out there. It's in 20 to 25 percent. I've heard it as high as 30, but I, I think 20 is a good number. It's one that I see repeated in research and so forth. So I think that's a good number. And, you know, on our, on our planet, that's over a billion people that have this. So it's, it's small and percentage wise, but in real numbers, it's actually quite a large group of people. And the idea in your book is that there is no difference in prevalence between men and women. About about 20% of men, about 20% of women are highly sensitive. That's correct. And, and it, even within the population of highly sensitive people, it's about 50-50. 50% are men, 50% are women. So it doesn't tilt towards women uh, and less of men. It's actually quite, quite uh, you know, uh, balanced in that regard. So you would like, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're on a mission to increase the number of men who are highly sensitive, who know they're highly sensitive, or happy they're highly sensitive, or proud of being highly sensitive, and who contribute their high sensitivity to the health of their families, their communities, their, their nation, and the world. Is that correct. fair to say? That's okay, absolutely, so, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I said that's fair to say. I mean, I, I initially when I wrote the book, I in even writing the blog, it was basically to talk about sensitivity. But I've started to see a much larger mission in here, and that really goes back to what Doctor N says about it's an evolutionary quality. And I think right now, particularly in this juncture in the history of the world, highly sensitive people really need to step up here and and do some modeling of of these characteristic traits that a lot of times are getting repressed, especially in men. And uh, I think we have a mission to do. And uh, that's probably become my own personal mission now is to, to help other men see that, that are highly sensitive. Well, I don't have any proof of this, but just intuitively, uh, based on what I've learned and experienced with men since 1983 when I started doing men's issues in a public way, I think that there's more than 20% of men Is who are right? highly sensitive. That's what I think. You know how, how it's often said that men are more romantic than women. Have you, have you heard that? Yes, I, I have. Even, I, yeah. And, and you mentioned that you thought that was true in your case. In the book, you, you mentioned you thought that was true in your case. Yeah, I'm kind of a romantic idealist, right? Uh, or hopeless romantic, I think is the way I put it in the book. Um, it's interesting that I ran across a study that said that, especially for platonic relationships, you, women usually get that right and men don't. <laughs> they usually try, jump over the line and get into the romantic part with a, part, with a friend, 
who happens to be of the opposite sex more easily than women do. And it, part of the reason is because men are not really good at doing relationships that are non-sexual. They, it's, it's sometimes very difficult for men to draw that line. Uh, women do that all the time. They're more verbal. They're more sort of uh, easily communicate things, and they can draw the line a little bit more clearly. So it was a kind of an interesting finding, and I, I think it's, it really supports what you're saying. So we're going to talk a little bit later about how to reach a great number of men who currently aren't thinking that they're highly sensitive, but might like to sort of be liberated in a way. Yes, I agree. To, 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 to embrace that. Now, um, I think I might be a highly sensitive man. I think he might be too. <laughs> what, um, what questions would uh, a person ask, would a clinician ask, uh, to try to help a person identify whether or not they are a highly sensitive man? man, woman, or whatever, your child, is they're really, Dr. Aaron is defined for scientifically evidence-based qualities that people have for this trait. There's a lot of people writing today about high sensitivity, so you get a lot of different opinions about what it is, but these four qualities are the ones that are the gold standard, and they you can use an acronym DOES, D-O-E-S, to, to describe that. The first characteristic is depth of processing. We have this capability of taking inputs, our sensory inputs and environmental inputs, and process them at a very deep level. So you, if you're a deep thinker or you're somebody who uh, tends to, uh, and I hate using this term because it's almost pejorative, but you ruminate a little bit about things maybe a little bit more than other people do, um, this is a quality that highly sensitive people have. You need a lot of processing time because you process at a very deep, uh, not only logical, but a emotional level. The second characteristic is um, where the O is overstimulation. We have a tendency to overwhelm very easily. I mean, we, we get a lot of sensory information coming in. We do a lot of processing, and that taxes our system. It's like running a CPU at 100%. And at some point, you need downtime. And so if you're the kind of person that needs to get away, be quiet, uh, recharge yourself, whatever, um, that's another indicator that you are very likely a highly sensitive person. The E is for emotional reactivity because we're very emotional people. We do respond very emotionally to things sometimes. It could be a painting or a sunset or a movie or how you feel about somebody that you know. These emotions are very real for us. And the other part of that E is empathy, because we're very empathetic people. We have a tendency to use these things in our brains called mirror neurons that allow us to mirror back what other people feel and, and, and what they have some relatability with them. So we're very empathetic as well. So those are other two characteristics. And the final one is what she calls um Sensing the subtleties in the environment. This is probably, I think, the magic uh, uh, that goes with high sensitivity. It's the sort of the magic power, superpower. It allows us to pick up sensory information from the environment. I like to think of it like this. It's an aperture and a camera, right? You know, it opens up to let more light in so that you, depending on conditions. And the same thing for highly sensitive people. I think our aperture is a little bit wider open. Uh, I don't think we have better sight, you can look at me, I wear glasses, or our hearing or anything else that makes us better, it's that the information gets passed through a lot more because we have a more wide open uh, sensory uh, ability to gather the data. And that goes down in that process of doing the deep processing and so forth. That gives us the ability to do some amazing things, being very creative, being able to pick things out of an environment, know what's wrong and what's right. So if those things ring a bell, with any of your listeners that they may have that, then I would suggest going out to hsperson.com. That's Dr. Erin Sykes. She has a little quick test you can do. It really is one of the only ways you, that, that it's out there to test for high sensitivity. And you can take that test and see if that you fall into that category. But I would suspect that you would. In your book, you mentioned your Myers-Briggs type. Myers-Briggs yes. type. Um, is that... 
is that um, typical? Is is your is your type? And I, you don't mind if I mention it? Since, since no, absolutely book. not. Yeah. You know, INFJ slash P. So your balance between the J and the P. Correct. Introversion, introversion, intuition, feeling, and judging slash perceiving. Correct. Is, is that pr- pretty typical? It really is. I, I'm surprised how many. There are not that many INFJs in the world, or slash P's. It's like like two percent of the human population, I think, based on what you know they've they, they've been able to determine. Um, but introversion is a very common thing in, in highly sensitive people. About seventy percent of HSPs are introverted, and surprisingly, thirty percent are extroverted. Uh, but most of the cases is that they're introvert, and most of them fall in that in category. Um, Jacqueline Strickland, who, who has done a lot of work on the Myers Briggs and, uh, and high sensitivity, has said that most of us fall in that NF category. Uh, the, the rest of them can kind of flow back and forth. But that INFJP, I've seen a lot of people, and I almost think that it's almost an automatic uh, give me that you're going to be an HSP if you've got that category. So um, I'm going to tell you what I scored, uh, or okay. what, what my rating or personality type was found to be the last time I took the Myers-Briggs a couple months ago. Um, I might Apparently, if I am an HSP, uh, I am one of the 30 percent. OK, because because I came up as E N F slash T and P's, which is extroversion. Intuition, same as you, uh-huh. feeling slash thinking, and perceiving. Right. Does that uh, seem compatible with being an HSP or an HSM? Oh, absolutely. It, again, I think the the thing that's probably the leading indicator is, is, as Jacqueline Strickland says, is that the NF is the piece that really is the anchor. Um, you can either be an I or an F, I mean, excuse me, an I or an E, um, uh, in terms of uh, whether you're extroverted or introverted. And then the last letter could probably fall just about anywhere uh, on the scale. But, um, yeah, that that absolutely sounds like you are HSP material. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the NF that you mentioned as being sort of the hallmark, the dyad that uh, that is at the center of this is uh, intuition and feeling. N, yeah. and F, int- N for Intuition and F for feeling. Correct. Okay. Very good. Okay. Well, there is an old joke in the men's movement (laughs) about two sensitive new age men. Yeah. And they are arguing about who's less competitive. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Go in the opposite direction. I I hear it. I'm. I'm less competitive than you are. No, I'm less competitive than yeah, you are. Yeah, of course, there you, you know, go. They're, well, they're, maybe they're there's com- some innateness to that, right? But um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's interesting. You bring that up. I mean, uh, the I, I was just thinking about this recently. A lot of times, uh, you know, I think about um, where women have been. Uh, progressing over the years in terms of women's um, rights and equality. You know, and I, growing up in the 60s, I knew, you know, a, about it because that's obviously was making news and and women were changing foundationally what their role was in society. Uh, and it, it, it continues to happen. But what was interesting about it is that I, there really wasn't a strong men's liberation movement. I think a lot of times because people were thinking, well, you've already got it all. You don't need to be liberated from that. And what I think was going on, especially during the 80s, is this movement towards having men sit and dialogue and talk and, you know, getting these circles where they were sitting around talking and doing things together was a start in getting men to talk about their feelings and talk about what was going on. But it really did not, I think, German, uh, germinate into a, a full-on liberation. And I think what's happening, what I'm seeing today, and perhaps because you are doing a podcast and talk to a lot of people, um is that there's a revitalization of this idea of what we define masculinity as. Um, This is a big question. And I noticed that as I talk to more millennials and Gen Z uh, men, that 
they're more open to the idea of saying, yeah, let's lift the hood up on this and let's see what's in there. Maybe we can change a few things around because it really doesn't fit culturally with what we are today. So that's something that I, 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 I was saying is kind of a task of mine. It's sort of a mission is this idea of helping from a highly sensitive man's point of view uh, because we're wired this way. We don't really, we, you know, we can suppress it, but really naturally we're, we're more open and intuitive, which is one of the characteristics you mentioned earlier about the uh, NFs. And be able to model this behavior for some of these younger guys and also model it for people of our generation as well. Um, because it, the masculinity that's been yoked, uh, been the yoke for, for many of us men over the, uh, our, our lifespan has been a real burden. And uh, it, it does, there just doesn't seem to be any correspondent thing in the men's section. And so that's, that's why I'm saying I think that sensitive men have a role here to help expose this and bring it out and, and even model what it could be like for men if they were allowed to be more, and this is the term I like using a lot now, is human. These are all human capabilities. We've culturally bucketed some of them to masculine, feminine, so forth, whatever. But truly, there are really human characteristics, this idea of being able to express emotion and feelings and be nurturing and intuitive and, you know, that kind of thing. So... Okay, very good. When we first uh, started corresponding to see if we'd be a good match for a podcast, um, you mentioned the phrase toxic masculinity. Yeah. And that is a phrase that I'm very sensitive to. Okay. Um, it sets off a lot of alarm bells for me. Sure. Um, so I wrote back to you and asked for your definition of toxic masculinity, and it was a it was a definition that I I kind of liked and appreciated, and and figured we could we could do a, a nice constructive uh, podcast here. Um, you said um, it's not anti male. It's not. It's, no. it's not anti male. Um, it's it's an invitation to be more fully human. And who doesn't want to be more fully human? Right. Um, but in your book, and here, before we get there, um, you were a corporate IT guy for many years. Correct. And you won some awards for being an outstanding manager. Right? I did. So I would suppose, I would suspect that you are the kind of manager who doesn't just want a bunch of yes people saying, yes, boss, that's such a great idea. We'll, we'll, we'll do it uh, just like you said, and uh, there's nothing else you need to think about. You know, right. you're so great. Um, you got it all. You value people who would say, yeah, boss, and let's think about some other things. And so what I would like you to do would be to think of me as a member of your staff. Okay. You're the boss because you are the man, as far as I know, you are the man about helping men embrace their humanness. Correct. What it really gets down to for me. And so I want to suggest, I mentioned earlier that I think there's more than 20% of the men out there that you could reach and benefit. Right. And thus, and thus benefit the world. Um, by developing our empathy, empathy is the hallmark, right, of mm -hmm. being an HSP, HSM, by developing our empathy for men. Because in my experience, men aren't getting a lot of empathy these days. No, they're not. And, you know, the, the term, um, the beatings will continue until morale improves. Yeah, comes to comes to mind here. Right. Um, you, as a as a boy, um, were criticized heavily by your grandfather. And your father, interestingly enough, who you who, whom you describe as an HSP, a highly sensitive person, highly sensitive right. man, he would ask you a very insensitive question: "Bill, are you a man or a mouse?" Mm -hmm. So. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. Is one of the emotions that you felt 
from your grandfather and from your father at those moments? Was it shame? Shame and rejection, yeah. Shame and rejection, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I want to mention to you that in March of 2018, March 8th of 2018, Forbes magazine had an article about what keeps people happy on their jobs. Mm -hmm. And I want you to think here about men on their jobs, you know, doing what the society wants them to do, right. wants us to do. Global studies reveal that 79% of people who quit their jobs cite lack of appreciation as a key reason for leaving. People don't leave companies, they leave bosses. So if you're feeling rejected at work, you know, they're pretty much asking you to leave. Right. Recognition is the number one thing employees say their manager could give them to inspire them to produce great work. If we want men to produce great work for the culture, recognition is a good place to start. So rather than focusing on toxic masculinity mm -hmm. and all the bad stuff that comes along with the roles we have, the, the yoke, as you put it, that we have put men, put men into, recognize the good that men do as the starting point. Mm -hmm. to sort of get men to put down their defenses. Look, we get defensive when we're told that our masculinity is toxic. Let me, let me give you a little window into the, to the, to the culture. Mm -hmm. do, do you remember um, a couple of years ago, Gillette, the razor company, put out a toxic masculinity video? They sure did. Yeah, I remember that very well. Okay. 37 million views. What do you think the ratio of thumbs up to thumbs down was? Oh, I'm sure it's predominantly down. 1.9. Almost two times as many downs as ups. There was, at about the same time, somebody immediately got onto, the, uh, onto YouTube and created the, what I think is a very clever and very effective parody of that uh, Gillette video. 1.3 million views. What do you think the ratio of down to up was? Or I'm sorry, of up to down was? 33, yeah. 33 to 1. Mm -hmm. 33 to 1, men said, thank you. This is great. Because it parodied this idea that men are fair game to be ridiculed and mocked and shamed. Right. Then there was a watch company called eGuard. Now, of course, this was a, probably partially at least a marketing effort. But eGuard makes men's watches. Mm -hmm. They put out a video called, um, I don't know what it was called, but it was about appreciation of men. 6.3 million views, the ratio of up to down, a video expressing appreciation for men, 52 to 1. Mm -hmm. 52 times more men appreciated being appreciated yeah. than didn't appreciate being appreciated. So I mentioned that, uh, that, that joke about the uh, sensitive new age men. Right. I want to suggest to you that there is one way in which I am more em empathic than you. And that is, I think, having worked in men's issues since 1983, I might be more empathetic, empathic to men right. than you are. For instance, you know, you took a pretty couple of rough shots at the idea of testosterone. Okay. Do, you, do you recall? Do you recall? Would uh, you like to? I, I, could you give me some context here? Because I don't remember exactly yeah. what you're quoting. Yeah. So you referred to it as a raging aggressive hormone. Which, you know, sounds pretty rough. A raging aggressive hormone. And there's nothing men can do about that. Yeah. You know, if they got testosterone and it's a raging aggressive hormone, they're going to say, well, I guess I'm just a raging aggressive idiot. You know, testosterone is not raging. It is aggressive, but that's not the same as violent. Um, and you use the term testosterone laden twice. Testosterone laden, as if it's a, 
this thing that we have to carry around and it's, you know, it's testosterone enhanced in some ways. In some ways. Everything's got to be in balance, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what I would like to suggest is that we could really bring men into the realm of saying, yeah, I'm sensitive and I'm damn proud of it. I'm a full human being. And what I feel, I feel. And I'm not saying I always deserve to feel that or what I feel is correct. Maybe my perception is wrong, but I feel what I feel and I have at least a right to talk about it, to express it. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of men would like that. You mentioned uh, in your book that... Um, your grandfather was rough on you, and your father was rough on you. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that men were rough on you. Other men and boys were rough on you. But one of the other things you mentioned was that, here, here it is, as I got older, the word sensitive and its perfect companion, too, became the pejorative too sensitive and began to surface. As you got older... Now it wasn't just male peers or male authority figures. Mm -hmm. Girls began to wield this blade as well. And so what I want to suggest is that what men would really like some empathy about, the role that they play, is some empathy about the role that they feel they have to play, or they are told to play, or they must play if they are going to be valued and appreciated by women and, you know, heterosexual men really want that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Dr. Aaron um, never once mentioned anything about testosterone in her book. She never mentioned, she really didn't d d d d uh, discuss uh, gender issues much, much at all. And so, you know, the idea of toxic masculinity People often say that it begins when little boys hear, big boys don't cry, mm -hmm. right? I would like to suggest that what I remember hearing, where I think toxic masculinity begins is when a, a little boy and a little girl are watching television together and a spider walks across the carpet mm -hmm. or the floor. And a little girl says, ooh, a spider, kill it. Okay. Ooh, a spider, kill it. Uh, what's the little boy going to do? What's, what's going to go through his mind? If he doesn't want to kill it, he might still have to kill it. It's just the beginning of what we expect masculinity to be about and what we allow femininity to be about. Right. You know, the woman, the girl, the female wants that spider killed, but violence by proxy. I didn't do it. He did it. So there are many things in our culture, I think, that we ask men to do, not just as men asking men to do it, but, you know, as Dr. Aaron said, she said, cultures have strong ideas about how little men and women ought to behave. Cultures, not men, not women, cultures. The issue is so important to us that it is almost funny. So what, what I want to suggest to you as a member of your staff is that you could find a whole bunch of men ready to give you a thumbs up. If you could bring yourself to say, you know, men are perfect, but they're pretty good. And women are pretty good, but they're not perfect. Because if we could acknowledge that women are part of this too, part of the demands on masculinity, men would say, thank you for recognizing that. I really appreciate that. Now can we work together to talk to women about this? Because right now the culture seems to be, you can't say a word other than that, you know, women are perfect and women are great and women are life affirming and you know, men are testosterone laden and we, we just got to do better than that. And I'm not saying we blame women, but I'm saying men would really appreciate some acknowledgement that women 
have a huge influence on what we wrongly term toxic masculinity. Yeah. And I, I think I state that in the book, Jack. I, I, it's, it's toxic masculinity is, is not my term. It's a term that you read about it all the time. And it, it's being pointed out. What I try to do, I think, in the book was to say, let's divorce this whole idea that you're born a male and you're culturalized, if you will, to be this masculine form, that, that this this ideal that uh, culture defines as what a masculine, what a man is supposed to be, and in many cases that ideal is impossible for men to live up to, right? It has nothing to do with what men naturally do, right? There are hormonal things that change us are different than than what women have. It's not. It's not masculinity that's the problem. I, it, I mean, that is the problem. It's the cultural definition. It's not men that are the problem. It's the definition that we assign to men. And I think that we're all learning, because I grew up with it. There was no discussion about sensitivity when I was six years old and or when I was five years old, and I was being socialized for this stuff, growing up to be a man. And I really think that... Um, I, I can't ignore that out there. It's, it's what we're being labeled as. Uh, but a lot of times that sword is being wielded in a way that it's cutting everybody, not people who have uh, are attributed to uh, promoting this kind of thing. A lot of men are very narcissistic about it, and they want to be dominant. And that's not always going to be the case. So I think we still have to talk about it. And I think men have to acknowledge that it's out there. And there are people who feel that way, not necessarily because they deserve it. But I don't, I, I, I don't have a problem bringing it up. But I certainly agree with you that I don't think we should live in it. And I don't think we should wallow in it. But it's going to have to be addressed at some point. And right now, the men of our generation, maybe a, a lot of adult men today, are going to have to wrestle with the term what masculinity means to them. It's being defined every day. Gender fluidity. I'd never even heard of that term before in the last maybe 10 years or so. Uh, but this is what's going on in our world. And so the emphasis for me and the book is not just about highly sensitive men. It's about Let's look at all these characteristics that we have that make us human. Let's be more like that. And there are going to be things that are going to be distinctly male, and there are going to be things that are perhaps distinctly, distinctly female. But I still think we need to, to, to deal with the, the problem. It's like acknowledging, recognizing the elephant in the room. And, and I, I'm not trying to say, now, as far as the testosterone comments in there, there's a little sarcasm in there as well about how we always associate testosterone with aggression. Um, and there is, there is some validity to that, I think, scientifically about it. So, again, it's, it's just something I was acknowledging. Uh, I'm not ashamed that I have testosterone coursing through me. I, I, not at all. Um, but I'm not necessarily an aggressive, um, ultra competitive person either. So we all have different levels of different hormones in our body. So again, I really would like to really focus the fact that um, I believe that highly sensitive men can help other men. Now, when you mentioned before, you think the percentage is higher. I, here's the reality that sensitivity is a spectrum, right? So it's like a bell curve, right? And so the very top end, 20%, maybe 25%, are those people that really are highly sensitive. But that doesn't mean the other 80% aren't sensitive at all. And so that, when you say there's a, a, a larger reach, I agree with you 100%. I think there's probably people on the other side of that, the curve that, that are in the hump and the broader uh, level of it, that this message will resonate with them as well. So it's not, it's not, like I said, just, uh, and this is one of the things that I'm trying not to do is get too hung up on the idea that there's a percentage at the very top end that are quote unquote highly sensitive and there's nobody else that can be sensitive from the, the, the other 80%. And that's not true. Uh, and I see that as well. I have friends that I know are not HSP, but 
they also have a very strong sensitive side to them. So you mentioned that um, men, some men want to be dominant. True. <clears throat> Can you, would you, will you acknowledge that some women want to be dominant? Absolutely. I, I, I worked in corporate America, you know, and this is during a period of time when women were starting to rise up in the ranks. And to my, myself, silently, I was saying, all right, we're going to get some females in here to, that will balance off all this sort of dominant, uh, top-down management style. It would be more open, more receptive to dialogue and communication. What I found that most of those women that were breaking through that ceiling were doing it because they were mimicking what the men were doing. And so we didn't have that balance that I was hoping for. There were just women who wanted to be that way, or maybe they just wanted to be dominant players, and that they figured that that's the way to do it. Again, that attribute... It probably fits into the human bucket of all kinds of things that we can be. And it doesn't matter if you're male or female. You can both be dominant. Uh, obviously, there are plenty, um, plenty of examples in, in our lives where we know of women who were. So you talked there about women getting into the previously male domain uh, of business, corporations, government, academia. Um, and the, the struggles that women had uh, achieving parity or breaking through in that, in that domain. What I would like to suggest is that there is another domain that we could quite beneficially, I think, uh, discuss as primarily female-dominated that men need help breaking into because when women got into corporations, they had to be more assertive. Mm -hmm. They had to uh, be able to hurt people's feelings when that was required for the health of the corporation. Maybe they did it in a nicer way than men. I don't know. Um, but women developed um, new capabilities in their repertoire when they got into the previous domain formerly uh, primarily male domain of business, politics, academia. There is another domain that will help men develop the, cult, the, the kind of characteristics that are prized and valued in that domain mm -hmm. if we can get women to fully and equally, not as better assistants, not as babysitters, but fully and equally embrace men for their sensitivity, for their nurturance, maybe not nurturance in the same style as women, right. but a male style of nurturance. If men knew they were valued in the, the, the female domain as much as women have been valued in the female domain, men would have the incentive, the reason, the, the goal of doing it. Mm -hmm. But just as there were men who didn't want women in the male domain, mm -hmm. there are many women who don't really want men in the female domain. Now, I know that m most of the women you and I probably know Mm -hmm. have careers, and they're probably pretty, pretty satisfying careers. And so they're happy to have men in the female domain, mm -hmm. maybe even as full and equal partners, not just as better assistants. But there are tons and tons, millions and millions of women who I would say are closely associated with the kind of men that we would possibly identify as the most toxic who don't have any other career other than being a mother mm -hmm. and being a homemaker. Mm -hmm. I'm the mother. And so they have an incentive to sort of downplay men's ability to be full and equal partners. And I think that hurts men. I think that hurts men a lot. I used to work for the National Fatherhood Initiative, okay. and I would train uh, prison systems 
to run a program called Inside Out Dad for incarcerated fathers. Mm -hmm. And believe me, if you want to touch a man's heart, you do it through his kids. Mm -hmm. That's how you, that's, that's his touch point. That's his sensitive point. And so what I would like to see the nation do, and I would like to suggest that you become a champion of this. Just as we had an Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to help women get into business, mm -hmm. we need an Equal Parenting Opportunity Commission to help men achieve parity and equality in the formerly, still primarily female domain of family relationships, nurturance. Um, men are dying for it. I mean, yeah, I, 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 literally, I, I, literally dying for it. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Jack. I mean, we're on the same page on this one. Um, again, nurturing is a human characteristic. We're a social pack animal. And if we don't have each other, we don't, and our offspring are some of the, takes some of the longest times to get, you know, out of the nest, as we all know. Um, and um, it requires really considering our situation in terms of work now where we've got very often couples both working childcare comes in there somewhere and somebody has to do i did it myself as well i was a parent and, and did the my wife worked one shift i worked another and i was doing parenting uh, with my children i totally agree with you there uh, but a lot of this has to do with bucking up against traditional values for what men and women are supposed to be doing. And, you know, this is the thing that needs to change. And I'm not saying men have to do all the work here. I'm saying that we need to look at this as a, as a culture about, uh, as I've said before, being human first. You can still be a man, you can still be a woman, but be human first. And the, that's part of, I, I attribute that nurturing part of it um, is being part of right up there at the top in the umbrella top of, of being a human being first. So I, I, I definitely think if there are people, if there are women that still hold on to the value that that's not a job for a man or that men can't possibly do it as well as a woman can, I, they've got some learning to do. Okay. I'm glad to hear you say that. And uh, the nurturing children piece mm -hmm. is just the core of what really needs to happen. Men need to be able to develop their uh, ability to have their feelings, feel their feelings, think about their feelings, talk about their feelings, process their feelings um, in every context in which they have feelings. Right. Um, you know, whether it's concerning parenthood or not. I mean, there are plenty of men who aren't parents who have feelings and sometimes their feelings are bad feelings and they and they hurt. I, I want maybe we maybe we can end with this. The, the, the main point that I would like to suggest to you about how you can really take your mission uh, into orbit is by starting with appreciation of men and recognizing that nobody wants to be nobody wants men to be more human than men themselves do mm -hmm. at base. They put away their their hum humanity sometimes because they got to. They got to stab somebody in the back or they got to mm -hmm. do a shady deal because they got to make the money, all of that stuff. Um, the main point, the, the other main point besides appreciation for men is we need to get to a point where we can ask women to please, please acknowledge that there is a power structure in female culture. Mm -hmm. I'm going to play for you a little piece of video of audio from um, the, radio, the radio show um, on, on Being with Krista Tippett. Um, the guest was um, Brene Brown, um, a professor of social work at the University of Houston. Mm -hmm. She's written many books. Yeah, I know who she is. Yeah. Know, yeah. So I want you to hear how difficult it is for Brene Brown to recognize that it's not always the patriarchy, it's not always men. Mm -hmm. here, here we go. 
I was at a book signing and a couple came up to me and I signed four books for the woman and she grabbed him and she's walked away from the table and her husband who was standing with her stayed and she said, come on, babe, let's go. And he said, no, I want to talk to her for a minute, you know, meaning me. And he, she said, no, come on, let's go. We're, you know, let's go. And he said, I'm going to talk to her for a second. And there was some tension in that conversation. He said, I really, I really liked everything you said. I really like this idea of, you know, reaching out and telling our stories and showing up, but you didn't mention men. So I looked at him and I said, I don't study men. And he said, well, that's convenient. And he said, because we have shame. We have deep shame. But when we reach out and tell our stories, we get the emotional beat out of us. And he said, and before you say anything about those mean fathers and those coaches and those brothers and those bully friends, my wife and three daughters, the ones who you just signed the books for, they had rather see me die on top of my white horse than have to watch me fall off. And then he just walked away. You know, when truth hits you, it just hits you and you know, you know what it is the second it comes to you. I knew that my research was going to be profoundly changed and I knew that it was going to be difficult and painful and that I was going to learn things about myself that I probably didn't want to know. And that's exactly what happened. I I remember driving home and having this moment where I was like, oh my God, I am the patriarchy. Like, Hmm. I'm facilitating this. I'm participating in this. Hmm. It's just a conversation that's way overdue, I think. It sure is, yeah. And so the bottom line for me there, Bill, is she had to identify the problematic power structure as patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And and she's not a member of the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. She's a member of, and and she and the the three daughters and the, the wife of that man are not members of the patriarchy. And I'm not saying they're bad and I'm not saying they're toxic, but they're human. And we really need to be able and men are dying for the opportunity in a nice way to say, yeah, but, you know, you're not perfect either. And sometimes you're pretty rough on me or I feel pressure from you or whatever it is they want to say. Right. We, we got to get there. And, and that will really help men own, embrace, celebrate, make use of their feelings. Well, let me just say this. What I got out of that segment was the fact that there was a revelation okay that to me is was more important than anything else she said of course yeah i agree with the the semantic misstep she did but the revelation that she understood because the guy was honest with her and this is what it really comes down to is being authentic and honest and open about it men don't want to admit i think a lot of men don't want to admit that this is a problem for them that they're expected to be on the white horse that's a hell of a responsibility you know, and you never get off of it till the day you die. In fact, so many men over the age of 50 are committing suicide because they can't ask for help. And so the idea that, that she had this revelation about what she was becoming, I guess, wrapped up in was to me the highlight of what that conversation was about, was that she understood it because he told her. He was authentic. He was open. He was honest. And I'll tell you the other thing, too, Jack, and I really appreciate your comments today. I I do. There's lots I have to learn. I'm not trying to come across as as somebody who's got years and years of experience doing this. I'm learning as I go. And I think all men are trying to do the same thing, learn as we go. But we need to be open and honest about where we are and that we've got Things men have to learn about women, women have to learn about men. But most of it, I think the boundary is cultural brick walls that we put up for all of our lives. We were socialized, taught, brought up that way. And if we don't start knocking the walls down, just like they took the Berlin Wall down, we're never going to get anywhere. We're never going to get past that. And I think that that really, to me, is when people have revelations like Renee Brown did then, I think that's, that's progress. Beautiful. One one final question. <clears throat> Excuse me. What do you think the chances are that that fellow at the book signing was an HSM? I, I, I it could very well be. I, there's really enough, uh, not enough to tell. But I, I think the fact that he was being honest and authentic was was more important than whether he was sensitive or not. I, I to me, that's where we got to live. We got to be authentic and honest. Very good. 
Bill Allen, it's been a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Jack. Take care. You too. Thanks for listening to Men Are Talking. Did we deliver? Did you hear something that made you think, wow, I never thought of it like that? If we did, tell your friends. 